My final guest is Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. She is the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use in the Department of Health and Human Services. And she's also the Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. I spoke with her a short while ago. Dr. Rittman, thank you so much for joining us today on, on really what's a sobering subject. I think this subject is one of the you know, major defining struggles of our time uh, inside our country. And I just want to start off asking you about your previous hat before you uh, joined the government in this role. And you were at Yale University, as I understand it, you were Director of Cultural Competence and Research Consultation uh, at Yale and looking at, and I'm always interested in the gap between what you saw and knew was happening in academia and what does government need to do to take advantage of your insights back then so that it can move the needle, uh, frankly, on this huge health challenge? Yeah. No, thank you for that question. I mean, you know, so for my, I was fortunate. My work in academia was often connected with the, the Connecticut State Department of Mental Health and Addiction mm. Services. Um, so I was really interested in sort of that intersection of academia and government. Uh, and so one of the things that was central to my work was using data. Um, so using the state data to be able to identify patterns and trends that could then ultimately help to inform policy development, practice, uh, even funding, uh, funding decisions. And so I think that um, that's one thing I'm real excited about now with my work at SAMHSA and that SAMHSA has a lot of really good data that can help uh, to inform um, our thinking related to policy and programs and, uh, and our funding streams. Well, thank you for that. And look, we have, we, we understand this sort of backdrop right now is that in the United States, opioid related deaths were in decline. And then this pandemic came along and now we have a massive surge in the wrong direction. Um, and I'm interested, you know, maybe the pandemic goes away and we see a lightening up in the social tension and personal tension and anxiety that people feel and perhaps get a correction. But when you look at the data, do you think there are tools, techniques, things you've seen around the country that, that we may need to bring forward to deal with the unique uh, challenges of this time? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good question. This is a unique time. It, it, it certainly is. I mean, we are seeing um, significant ripple effects uh, as a function of the pandemic. Um, CDC data shows that both uh, rates of um, anxiety, depression uh, are up. Uh, we also know that the uh, opioid uh, and overdose deaths uh, have also spiked over the past year. Um, and when we look at data, we also see that young people, so children, are, are using emergency departments more uh, over the past year as a function of mental health challenges. Um, and so thankfully, there are models and services and supports across the country um, that make a difference uh, and that can help people move into long-term recovery if they're struggling with addiction uh, or that can help to address the mental health challenges they may be experiencing. Uh, and so, you know, one thing that I often like to let people know is that, you know, if they're struggling, they need not struggle alone, that they're, you know, reach out uh, no matter what state they're in. There are services and supports available uh, that they can access to help them uh, with any mental health or substance use challenges they're experiencing. Um, and SAMHSA and the current administration, we're, we're investing heavily uh, within state systems of care and community systems of care. Uh, to ensure that people have the services and supports that they need. Dr. Rittman, what do you find to be the most effective way to get an environmental change in stigma, right? So I've talked to a lot of folks in your profession, bipartisan members of Congress that care so deeply about this issue, and they keep talking about stigma, which seems to be something you can control. Uh, if you get it right, but I, I'd just be interested in your insights in SAMHSA and, and, and how you teach others in this field to help neutralize that, that stigma. Yeah, you know, stigma, you're right. Stigma is just such a challenge in terms of its impact on people's likelihood of accessing services, their willingness to access services. Um, one strategy we know that makes a difference is, you know, working with trusted messengers working with community members that are um, valued within a community um, and, and partnering so that they can help us with disseminating information and key 
uh, key strategies or essentially just information about services and supports. Um, I think another strategy that really makes a difference is, you know, within the recovery community, people sharing their stories of recovery. Uh, I think that often helps to address stigma. Uh, people are able to see that, you know, recovery is real and recovery is, is very possible. And when people share their stories of recovery, it helps to give people hope um, and helps to break down stigma. Um, so just those two strategies alone can make a difference, you know, partnering with the recovery community, but also partnering with trusted community messengers uh, and stakeholders that can help with sharing key messages. I think it's, uh, that sounds very promising. In another issue I've been interested in, um, and, and I used to talk to folks a lot more during the Obama administration about this, when the Affordable Care Act was coming on, and as the focus of healthcare was moving to more to be about, you know, wellness in the over end. But when it came to mental health, it came to addiction uh, and and the related uh, challenges of that. It was sometimes hard for me to figure out where that fit in to the business model of health providers. Do you think we've done enough to, to make sure that mental health and addiction services are built in across the board when it comes to the kind of care platforms we have, or do we still have deficits there? No, I mean, I think there's certainly more that we can do. You know, we do know that our healthcare systems, um, there, there's still fragmentation there that, that we're working on in terms of healthcare integration. That, that's one of the priorities uh, that SAMHSA, uh, you know, that, that we're working on. Um, we know that, you know, people may go to their primary care doctor uh, and it's so important if the primary care doctor is skilled to be able to do an assessment for substance use or any mental health challenges the, the individual may have. Um, so one of our grant programs, the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, clinics are geared just towards that. Um, we now have over 400 of them across the country. We've recently awarded an additional 100. So that, that's what brought us up to the 400. Uh, and these are integrated care sites. Uh, they're sites that provide both mental health, substance use, uh, and can connect people to primary care services and supports as well. Um, so I would say that's one, one area where as a, as a country, I think it's, it's certainly a priority for, for SAMHSA, but integrated care is an important area of work that, that uh, is critical to move forward. You know, one of the other um, I guess, troubling trends that we saw after COVID hit. And, and I, everyone has talked about it, but I don't know the solution to it, which is how it hit different communities in America so differently, um, that communities of color were, were hit hard. You look at the death rate, infection rate, you look at the access to services. But if you go beyond that to even things like uh, 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 Black um, uh, female uh, uh, infant mortality, and you look at the the dimensions there and the disparities. And I'm just wondering, you know, I know SAMHSA will not have the answers to all of that, but you're a smart person, you're driven by data. And I'm interested in what can we do to erase that gap? Yeah, you know, there are things that we can do to erase that gap. I mean, certainly looking at the data, and we've talked about that, you know, in order to address the gap, we have to be aware of the gap. So continually, anytime we're doing a final report on a project or initiative, critical to look at the data, to disaggregate that by race, ethnicity, gender, age, even region, if we can, to see, are there particular patterns and trends that that data can, can let us know about? You know, I think the other thing though, is there are, there are sort of tools and resources that can help organizations uh, and community agencies related to um, ensuring that their services are culturally responsive. Um, so for example, the HHS Office of Minority Health has developed uh, a set of guidelines they call the cultural and linguistic competence standards. Um, and those standards are uh, those, actually it's a cultural linguist, yeah, cultural linguistic competence uh, standards. And now they've actually developed a behavioral health guide for the class standards. Um, and essentially those are 14 standards that if organizations um, implement them, it, they can help to reduce disparities. Um, so things like, you know, looking at, you know, ensuring that the workforce is diverse, um, ensuring that, uh, that there's connection with community and community members are engaged as part of the, uh, the, the process, um, ensuring that there's appropriate training in place so that people uh, have training to be able to administer culturally responsive services and supports. Um, so there's 15 different standards that if implemented 
uh, it can help to reduce the gaps and reduce the disparities that, that we're seeing within both behavioral health, um, but across healthcare more broadly. You know, and obviously my, my brain wasn't working correctly here. I, I, I meant maternal mortality, just kind of stumbling over some things. This is a you know, very real discussion and I'm happy for just, I'm interested in your interactions with legislators, and members of Congress, when you're working with Connecticut uh, back then, but today as you're dealing with federal legislators, do you think their awareness and literacy on these very important subjects is where it needs to be? Do we need more teach-ins to bring uh, members of Congress up to speed with what is happening and what the best and promising practices for dealing with um, uh, addiction and and mental health ought to be. Yeah, you know it's a it's a great question. And so, um, so the first part of the question in Connecticut, um, you know, my approach, and I, I was always um, thrilled to be able to do sort of community forums. Mm -hmm. uh, or to engage with legislators uh, related to just this work and, and often did that, you know, we would do um, opioid related forums across the state. Um, with my work now, you know, it's been wonderful to see just the level of um, engagement um, and awareness on these really pressing issues among members of Congress. Um, so throughout my confirmation process, I did one on one meetings. Um, I've also participated recently in a lunch and learn. Uh, so there are lunch and learns that uh, are held. Uh, that the Congress, uh, you know, Congress uh, folks attend. Um, and so, you know, I think there is quite a bit of awareness and, and advocacy uh, related to behavioral health. It was, it was wonderful and refreshing to see because, you know, I think right now more than ever, um, we need that, we need all of us to lean in really on the behavioral health challenges that we're seeing both in terms of mental health and the substance use uh, patterns and trends. And so I, I was, I was, I'm not gonna say surprised, but it was just nice to, nice to see the level yeah. of engagement um, and the, the really cued in questions that I got and meeting the members of the um, senators teams as well. You know, I think they uh, are, are heavily involved in, in doing the research. And, and so um, I think there is a good bit of awareness there. And, and then just finally, Dr. Rittman, um, I'm gonna ask you a bifurcated question. Um, you know, one is what does SAMHSA need more of to succeed so that we know during your tenure we've gained ground? What, what do you need to succeed in it? I think the second thing is just I know you're so knowledgeable in this area. You know, I was fascinated by the National Council of Behavioral Health launched this thing years ago called Mental Health First Aid to train sort of first responders and others on that. Front. I was so taken, you know, with that with that you know, practice. And I guess my question is, are there things in the toolkit that would be good for our viewers to hear that they can have a personal connection, you know, on these important issues of, of, of what to do with members of our community um, that are suffering from addiction, uh, opioid abuse, or, or other dimensions of, of mental health challenges? I just kind of like to hear from you, you know, what counsel you would give folks listening to this show right now on what they can do. So two quickies mm -hmm. there. What does SAMHSA need and what can, what can our, our viewers do uh, in this realm? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, that's an important question. I mean, in terms of viewers, you know, there is a lot of information out there related to how to access services and supports, how to navigate healthcare systems. Um, I think, you know, one thing viewers can do is they can go to our website. Um, we have something we call a treatment locator. Um, so if they're struggling or if somebody that they know is struggling and needs to get connected to services and supports, you know, they can go to the SAMHSA website and get information about um, how to access services and supports and how to navigate care. Um, or there, there's also information there about, you know, being able to recognize signs that an individual is struggling or maybe having feelings of suicide. Um, there's information related to that as well. Um, and so, you know, I think one thing that we can all do is, you know, check on you know, for one, educate ourselves, you know, just be aware of, of where the resources are and how to access them. Um, and then check on people in our lives. Uh, you know, if there are, are family members that are older or neighbors that live by themselves, we can, it's important, I think, to check on folks just to make sure they're okay, um, especially now as we're going through the pandemic. Um, in terms of what SAMHSA needs, I mean, one thing, one thing we do regularly is we have, and this is a small thing, but it's a small thing that makes a difference. Um, we have an active social media account. Um, I, I encourage people follow us and share, 
you know, share the, the information that we put out there. Often it's just the things we're talking about, um, you know, how to access services and supports. And you never know when uh, that is going to save somebody's life, actually. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. Uh, for folks that are active on social media, we have an active, again, Twitter, um, as well as Facebook. Share those resources because it, it can be life-saving for folks. Um, I think the other thing that I need that, that is I just did it. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, the other thing is just, you know, the, the partnerships. Um, we so appreciate our collaborations uh, with our partners across the country and our grantees. And, and so, uh, you know, I think that's another thing that, that we need just to continue to grow and enhance um, our partnerships with providers and groups all across the state that are and country really that are doing this important work of uh, you know behavioral health. Um, it's such a critical time now as we talked about at the top of the um, of, of our discussion that uh, increasingly it's, it will take an all hands on deck approach um, to address the mental health and substance use challenges that we're seeing and we know prevention is it's important to remember prevention. Um, prevention plays a critical role here. Uh, and so that, that's a critical part of the work as well. Well, thank you. Well, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, uh, who is Assistant Secretary of SAMHSA, and SAMHSA is the Mental Health and Substance Abuse, um, it, I, I should get this right, she's Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Mm -hmm. Thank God we have SAMHSA to say, because <laughs> it's a long name. But, <laughs> but Dr. Rittman, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and candor. Good luck with your work. I know how important it is. We really appreciate your time today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on and appreciate the discussion. Take care. That brings us to the end of our program today. A big thank you to Indivior for its support of these conversations and to all of you for attending today and joining us for this discussion. For any of you who have missed the conversations, we'll have this video up from our event up on our website shortly. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.